everyone, and welcome to session two of the DREI Talks. I'm Hiba Jaber, DREI Senior Advisor and Trainer and Moderator for this session. In today's talk, we are discussing with our panelists, who are qualified practitioners and academic experts in real estate and business, the importance of education and vocational training, particularly post-COVID-19, and why real estate professionals need to undergo regular training to remain up to date on all the changes that are impacting the sector. We will highlight two main disciplines in real estate, education and valuation, and the importance of embracing digital transformation in both fields. I'm honored to introduce our speakers, Hind Elmeri, CEO of Dubai Real Estate Institute, the educational arm of Dubai Land Department, part of Dubai government. Hind has been a key person in restructuring and managing the operations at the Institute, where she also managed key strategic projects, studies, and research initiatives at Dubai Land Department and RIRA. Andrew Bum, Professor of Practice, Said Business School, University of Oxford. For the past 30 years, Professor Andrew Bum has combined business and academic life. He has spent the majority of this time teaching, undertaking applied research and developing property investment strategies for institutional real estate investors. He is chairman of Property Funds Research, chairman of Newcore Capital Management, and advisor to several other real estate organizations. He has also been voted one of the most influential people in PropTech. Simon Townsend. Simon is a senior director and head of the valuations and advisory business at CBRE in the UAE. Simon has wide ranging valuation experience across the MENA region, advising financial institutions, developers, funds, and business entities alike. Nahla Nana, Digital Business Transformation Advisor for DREI. Nahla has a broad marketing and communications, consulting, research, and innovation experience across many sectors, aviation, real estate investments, facilities, and waste management, environmental management, security energy, and education across MENA region and Europe. She provides insightful advice on innovative business solutions to governments, corporations, and non-government organizations. Hind, I'd like to start this session with you this morning as we address the importance of education in real estate and its inevitable transformation during COVID-19 era. Can you please tell me in your own opinion, how crucial is education in real estate? Good morning, first everyone. Uh, pleased to be with you uh, here today. Hopefully you can hear me well and we'll have an um, insightful session today. How crucial is education in real estate is as crucial and important the real estate sector is. Real estate is an ever evolving business and professionals associated with this real estate uh, business uh, needs to be not only um, um, relevant or effective in the business, they need to keep a, a key, keen eye on the most and latest developments um, um, in the sector. Um, Dubai is a key contributor in the uh, Emirates economy and GDP and it's continuously growing. Um, Dubai is known with its iconic buildings, um, lively lifestyle, um, uh, investor-friendly regulations, high return on investment, um, which attracts the global uh, investors, and uh, it's been a shining star in the global real estate sector. Um, as a result, it um, attracts investors from all over the globe, not only to invest in Dubai, but to keep Dubai as a second home. Um, therefore, we need to supply Dubai real estate uh, uh, sector with uninterrupted supply of qualified professionals who can be um, 
abreast of this competition and uh, ever evolving and changing industry. Uh, therefore, comes the importance of education in the real estate sector, despite whatever crisis, whether economic, health, or any crisis happens to any industry. And here comes also the role of Dubai Real Estate Institute to empower these real estate professionals um, um, and, and um, making them um, um, up to the level, to the market uh, expectation and to their employers' uh, uh, needs as well. And um, our vision is to become the leading international uh, benchmark in spreading the, the real estate knowledge in the region. Thank you so much, Hen, for your insight into this. So can you just tell me or maybe give me a little bit more details on what did Dubai Real Estate Institute do today in terms of uh, providing educational support or maybe tools uh, to people in the industry, to its stakeholders in the real estate, uh, not necessarily just within Dubai, but within the region as well? The Institute is a leading community providing comprehensive and high quality real estate programs for graduates and professionals uh, working within the real estate sector and other related uh, sectors, such as the banking, uh, insurance, and so on. We offer a wide spectrum of courses uh, in different topics. Uh, we partnered with lots of uh, well-known universities and international associations and uh, uh, institutions uh, globally. Um, we not only run programs, but also we have um, um, the Innovation Center where we, where we run camps from all over the world. Uh, we have audience who came together to solve challenges within the real estate market or their businesses. Uh, we have the REI Talks, which we used to run in, the, uh, in our premises, but now virtually, uh, luckily. Um, we have also our monthly publications and um, um, uh, research papers that we announce and um, um, feed the market with. Um, aligned with Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum uh, statement, excellence is a good habit one should occur. And Mr. Andrew today will talk about our collaboration with Oxford University, bringing a well-known and well-demanded uh, real estate program to Dubai uh, to support these professionals, uh, especially after the COVID crisis, uh, uh, to perform better in the, in the uh, industry. Um, soon, we will launch the new career and um, recru recruitment platform uh, in Dubai Real Estate Institute. And this is an open invitation for everyone to sign up to our, our website, to be the first to know and book their seats for our coming um, activities as well. Um, the initiative that we just talked about, um, is that what you call the uh, Masar, right? The Masar, yes. And I honestly think, uh, you know, again, this is a great initiative considering um, the type of, you know, crisis that we're uh, going through right now. Lots of people are asking about, you know, hints uh, simply because they would either let go of their existing positions or maybe trying to uh, look into potentially uh, uh, switching or uh, basically exposing themselves to uh, uh, different uh, uh, opportunities out there. So this is definitely an amazing tool. I think that they could, and, and how can they take advantage of that? Do they have to log into the website? Do they have to be part of the REI family? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, for Masar and for the uh, iDream membership also, um, um, Dubai Real Estate and uh, International Membership. Um, a candidate needs to uh, sign up. Masar will be for free for all our uh, graduates and uh, students. Um, it's an uh, AI um, uh, augmented system will read the, the information of uh, the client and will create the CV automatically and will match up with the existing uh, job offers and um, advise the candidate which courses needs uh, to take and extra um, um, experience needs to uh, carry to match certain uh, qualifications and the job um, uh, offerings in the same uh, MSR. The international membership will, will give them an open channel to communicate with a real estate ex experts from around the world, not only to network for business, but also to learn and support each other and in, 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 um, succeeding in this business. And also brighten the horizon in terms of the courses that they can also, uh, and I guess webinars, 
itself through its uh, international affiliation. So um, that's definitely something that we need to all uh, watch for, and hopefully we'll get more information as we access, as you said, in the Dubai Real Estate Institute. Um, my, my last question for you today is, um, and this is, Personally, I've gotten so many questions about that simply because people are used to uh, Dubai Real Estate Institute uh, being a uh, institute that offered uh, live type of training, right? You you come to the fourth uh, floor of Dubai Land Department or at different uh, uh, hotels in order to uh, take the training that you are interested in. What has Dubai Real Estate Inst Institute do uh, in order to cater to the training needs? Have you offered... Um, um, online training programs during the current times, recognizing that we were for a good couple of weeks, not three weeks on lockdown. Um, taking a strong cue from Dubai government support during the crisis and the support of our faculty uh, and the technology in place. During 2000, uh, uh, this year, 2020, we offered lots of courses online, but people love to enjoy uh, networking at Dubai State Institute and, meet, and meeting their peers and the, the experts face to face um, for the sake not only education but learning from each other experiences. During the COVID and from the early signs of the virus, uh, first week of March, I had to stop um, um, all the face to face courses and move uh, into online education. Whomever wanted to take it online, um, the platform is ready. Whomever is waiting for July or August courses, we're also welcome them. We're trying to be kind of a, a, a soft with them, not to um, uh, force them to complete their certification a certain time, but uh, give them the opportunity to choose whatever they like. Plus, we run. Um, um, we keep engaging with our students by running such webinars, talks, and, and um, virtual meetings uh, to not only um, uh, each or, or educate them, but also to hear from them. With the crisis, lots of behaviors change, lots of, lots of candidates' preferences change, and we need to listen and, and then um, uh, cope and change our or adjust our offerings to support these professionals uh, um, working in the real estate region or um, um, Dubai, I mean, or the region. We've been running online courses with our partners in Bahrain and KSA. So we were lucky also not to stop uh, the, the education process, but to, we continue uh, virtually with our clients. And again, we keep that Q&A session open to hear from the audience and support them. Um, and I think um, it's, it's a must to support all the professionals, especially working in Dubai market and the regions and who knows, and, and uh, being um, um, candidates with DREI to keep engaging with them and supporting them and together inshallah we will pass through this and we'll stay together and stronger after this crisis. Well, Hind, I can testify to the fact being part of the DREI team, uh, I can testify to your leadership, to be honest with you, in um, recognizing the needs in the market, recognizing that things needed to change in order to adapt to the situation that simply hit us by uh, surprise. Uh, you adapted quickly. Uh, not only that, but it is really through uh, your leadership, you were able to, uh, for example, talking about myself, not just hosting the online session, but advising us as part of the REI family to uh, have the uh, Q&A session. So basically now uh, we have uh, we have, we, have, we have options for trainers to be able to engage with their audience uh, with Q&A sessions. I myself have conducted many of those uh, sessions. Um, people have reached out to me on many occasions and we were able to connect with uh, various departments within Dubai Land Department. So I also commend Dubai Land Department uh, for being there, trying to uh, cater to everybody's needs and to help out in this very unusual circumstances that we have witnessed. So thank you so much and we will always count on your support. Um, with that, I'd like to uh, move to uh, our uh, second uh, panelist today. Good morning uh, to you, uh, Professor um, Andrew. Uh, Professor Andrew, what I want to hear from you today is you highlighting the benefits 
gained by enrolling in the real estate program at Oxford. Um, as Hint mentioned, uh, DREI has partnered with Said Business School to expand its courses offerings in real estate. So can you just give us an introduction about this curriculum and its objectives? Okay, thank you for inviting me and it's nice to be speaking to people in Dubai, which is a um, great place to visit, an important part of the global real estate market. Uh, the, the Oxford programme has been running for five years. We have a limit of 50 delegates in every, every classroom. We've been sold out every time. Um, I think out of the 300 delegates we've had so far, we've had 70 countries. Uh, we always have a healthy representation from, from the Middle East. Uh, including Dubai, and it makes absolute sense for us to visit Dubai and to, to meet a lot of people in the region. The course is, um, has got two, two really um, unusual aspects to it. The first one is that it's, it's decidedly international, so we run case studies um, describing buildings, developments, investments from all over the world, including the Middle East. Um, and the second thing is that it's based on research. We have a research unit at Oxford called the Future of Real Estate Initiative. So for the last four years, we've been actively researching innovation and technology in, in real estate. And um, we have a list of um, mega issues which are hitting the real estate market, which was a pretty big list last year before COVID-19 hit. So we now have a, a fascinating menu of change items that are affecting the real estate market. And we... We like to uh, talk to as many real estate professionals as possible to share our views about the way the future is going to be, focused on 2025 to 2030. Yes, and, and definitely this is something that, um, like you said, is just uh, on bar with everything that we are witnessing in uh, today's market conditions. We've noticed how uh, it is very important to innovate. Uh, recognizing that the way we're going to do things um, uh, post COVID-19 and I guess even moving forward with technology, uh, we're definitely uh, changing the way we perceive things. Um, tell me a little bit more about who do you think this program um, would be good, um, I guess, educational experience for in terms of the target audience or give us a little bit more information on uh, will it be offered uh, anytime soon? Um, is that something that we need to look forward to in the fall? Can you just give us a little bit more information about the timeline? Sure, we're, we're, we're very much looking forward to being in Dubai in late October. Uh, we, we will have a, we have a three to four day program lined up to deliver in Dubai. Uh, with the Dubai Real Estate Institute, and we're really looking forward to being there. We very much hope that uh, nothing will stop us uh, visiting Dubai in October, and uh, fingers crossed, or inshallah, that we will be there at the right time and in person, and um, we, we're looking forward to that. Um, so uh, it's important part of our plans that we, we meet people face to face. Um, if, we, if we can't do that, then we, you know, like everyone, and I'm sure like, like you all at Dubai Real Estate Institute, we've been learning to use Zooms, Teams, uh, WebEx, go to seminars. We've been building our expertise and um, I'm slightly more competent now at running an online seminar than I was three weeks ago. Uh, hopefully by October I'll be extremely competent, but equally hopefully uh, we'll be able to travel and meet people. Because as you said earlier, there, there is no, no real substitute for, for being together in a room and uh, it's, it's the networking advantage, it's, it's just observing people's body language and responding to what they're showing. Um, however, what, what we have learned is that a combination of online and face-to-face -face is very, very powerful. and I suspect we'll all be better at teaching as a result of this crisis because there's no reason at all why we can't prepare classes with case studies, with uh, all sorts of exercises, with, with getting to know each other in breakout rooms. There's all sorts of things we can do before we meet um, to become better acquainted and more familiar so that by the time we do meet, we have a much more vibrant experience in the classroom, which is really getting to, the, getting to grips with all the issues that people are facing. So I'm confident that whether it's in face-to-face in, -face in October or online or both, um, we, we will hopefully deliver something really interesting to people in Dubai. How was it for you to switch into online, um, kind of like, um, I guess, for the session that you guys have 
uh, for this year? I mean, how, how, how did people and students um, enrolled in live sessions uh, take it now that everything moved into it remotely? Um, because I believe that you guys have the same, uh, if not even stricter um, restrictions than we're facing here. Yes, I will. well, we're, I have an MBA class this afternoon, so I have a three-hour class this afternoon, um, which is um, challenging. Eight, I have 80 students online at the same time. It's very, very difficult to manage 80 people in a, in a sort of a one-to-one -one model. I mean, particularly when my, my, my own teaching method is very Socratic. You know, I, I, I very much like to throw out questions and uh, engage in one-to-one -one conversations with as many people in the classroom as possible. On, online, it's, it's a little tougher. We use, the, um, we use the chat facility so that there are questions coming in all the time. We have lots of breaks so that I can deal with the chat uh, so that people can have a little break. We do lots of exercises. We have lots of, uh, lots of quizzes, question times where people can just sit back and we use the breakout rooms a lot so that people go into small groups to discuss things with each other. Um, Having said that, you know, I'm, uh, you know, it's frustrating that I can't meet my MBA students and, uh, you know, it's, it's important that you do build these relationships. So we will make sure that we, um, that these MBA students and, and all of our students will meet face to face at some point, whether it be after their, even if it's after their degree is finished. So it's not ideal, but people adapt, right? Um, this is what uh, humans do. We just simply try to make best with any situation. Um, on a personal level, uh, my son is uh, graduating law school and he pretty much had to do the same thing. So, and that's one thing that he said he missed, that kind of interaction with his professor, uh, with his uh, uh, fellow students and, and working in teams and groups. Uh, and virtually it's kind of not the same, but if that's what we have to do, we yeah, got to do it. I agree. And, and I think um, this period also, there's a lot of personal responsibility. People can adapt to this in one of two ways. They can engage fully and use all of the facilities that are available. So they can use the chat, they can, they can engage, they can concentrate, they can focus, they can make sure they're not on Facebook, they're not doing emails, and they are absolutely focused on what can be quite a demanding, you know, three hour session, albeit broken up into, into half an hour um, sections. But they can also pretend that they're engaged and they can, they can switch the video off, they can switch their audio off, they can, play and doing emails, they can do what they like, but they, they know, you know, you know that it's about your personal honesty. You know, are you really engaged? And it's harder in the classroom to, uh, to do that. It's harder to switch off in the classroom. And, uh, you know, I, I have a habit of walking around the back of the classroom to make sure that people aren't using Facebook. It's difficult to do that online from a distance of many thousand miles. So um, you are reliant on people's personal honesty and engagement. And you need to get them engaged as much as possible so they're genuinely looking forward to the session. Absolutely. I mean, this is part of our training tools as well. I always, always call on that person that I know was just thinking about, you know, when is lunch or, you know, <laughs> when is my next break? But it is really hard to, to get that feel. But uh, we'll, of course, use the best of the tools that we have currently. And one last question for you, just back to the program that you're running with the Dubai Real Estate Institute. Is there any prerequisites for that program in terms of um, a certain level of education um, or certain courses that people have to have in place prior to enroll um, in, in the uh, master's program not not um, not any particular courses I mean you know, most people of course are professionally qualified or or are you know uh, certainly de degree level qualified I mean most of our people are minimum age 25 maximum age 80 um, we get people who are real estate owners who have, who have never formally studied real estate so they may have a business degree they may be lawyers they, they, they may you know whatever they may have done retailing but They've never had a formal real estate education, so that's a, that's one group. These are senior people with a lot of money under management who would just like to have an intensive um, uh, exposure to real estate uh, academics. Then uh, we have a second group who are um, non-real estate professionals like legal counsels, CIOs, CFOs, heads of information, risk, who have been parachuted into a big real estate business who need to learn very quickly what's going on in the market. And then the third group is the, is the senior professional or the aspiring senior professional who's maybe 30, 35 years old, real estate qualified, never been to business school maybe, and they want something that's really going to 
elevate them to the board with uh, a lot of strategic innovation thinking. Um, so that, that's the, qualifi the qualifications required are really that, that they have some exposure to the real estate market and they're keen and they're intelligent. Well, that's good to know. It's never too old or I guess too young to start learning. So thank you so much for um, giving us your time. Uh, and with that, I'd like to uh, move over to uh, Simon. Good morning to you, Simon. And Good morning, hi. How are you? Uh, Simon, I want to get into or, or get a little bit of your insights on uh, real estate uh, valuation methods uh, during COVID-19. Um, but before we get into that, can you just uh, give us and our participants more of an overview about the valuation services and sectors? Yeah, thank you and uh, good morning, everybody. I think uh, regardless of what sector in the real estate world you work in, I think every, uh, every decision you make has an impact on value. And to us um, as a business and to me personally, the valuation fundamentals are the, probably the most important lesson that people can learn as they go through their real estate career. If you look at all of the real estate um, courses and university uh, projects in the UK, they all have a very strong component of valuation. So to me, valuation is one of the most important uh, service lines we have. I think if you look at what's happening in the world at the moment, Bloomberg yesterday came out with an article that suggested that there's going to be a significant growth in bank loan restructuring. And as such, potentially the busiest real estate advisors will be the valuers. Um, you know, we, we as a global business, we had our EMEA and APAC calls this morning. Again, we see significant optimism in the, uh, in the valuation world. So I'd say to... Uh, to most understanding valuations, the mechanics and the, uh, the modeling of valuation is fundamentally important for everything that we do, particularly when markets change. And, and I think you know, any changes through markets is changing the role of the valuer um, in terms of what we're being asked, but it's not changing what we do. So um, I think I've been here since just 2000, um, was when I landed in the UAE and uh, been valuing things since then. And hopefully uh, some of the case studies that Professor Professor Andrew presents, I'll have had some intimate knowledge of from a valuation point of view. But I think, you know, the most important thing I would, I would say is that valuations underpins and will continue to underpin everything that I do and probably most of the participants on the, uh, on the call will do. Um, I'm not sure if, if this is something that you can get into, but just being within this region, have the banks contacted you, for example, uh, either personally or your department or your company to uh, revalue uh, their um, real estate uh, portfolio? I mean, is that I think, happening? Yeah, I think what I would say is valuations are required for a number of purposes. You know, some are compulsory through regulation, whether it be to comply with accounts and others, and some are um, discretionary where banks need valuations or you know, individuals or corporates need valuations. We are engaged, as always, as our, you know, our, our peers and our competitors, we are engaged with most of the local banks um, and international banks, as well as the family groups, investors and others. I think it's a little too soon, to be honest, to, um, to consider undertaking portfolio revaluations. I think from an accounting point of view, traditionally, the end of the year is when most of the accounts are um, finalised and most of the audits start. So there's still a little bit of work um, tidying up being done with the 2019 numbers. I think banks are certainly working very closely with their borrowers in terms of their portfolio debt restructuring programs and others. And I think those revaluations will come and I'm confident some of the discussions that we're having with some of the large local banks will result in those discussions, uh, those assignments. But I do think it's a little early. I think people are still just trying to um, adjust their portfolios and, and work out how they can get through this, this period. But it is an important point, an important point that, that I raise that there's this feeling outside that everything is grey, the clouds are dark and you know, the values therefore must go down. And, and I think working with banks, working with owners, working with investors, you know, looking at the, the nature of the portfolio, becoming more of an advisor than a valuer. They're, obviously, the value is driven by the revenue that that building or that asset provides you. But if we can adjust that revenue in a positive way, maybe we have to give rent free. Fair enough. You know, we have to adjust the lease. But what do we do to ensure the capital value doesn't change? We're answering those questions at the moment. Maybe we need longer leases. Maybe we need to imply some growth. Maybe we need to do different things. But it shouldn't, by giving away rental, shouldn't necessarily be significantly detrimental to your, your valuation or your capital value. So there's a lot of work that 
valuers are doing to ensure that the portfolio values at least are um, protected as best they can. I think growing is difficult, but protected as best they can. So becoming an advisor is a role that um, we're seeing the valuer merging into as we move forward. I agree with you, Simon, and especially because you know, like you said, um, there's a lot of unknown factors at the moment. This is this is a crisis that nobody um, has dealt with before, right? And it's just, it hit us out of nowhere. Um, there's always, uh, like you said, those kind of uh, uh, gloomy reports about, oh no, you know, this is another 2008, 2009. Um, having said that, uh, you know, again, just from uh, reading reports and uh, uh, publications the same way that everybody does you know we do have uh, sellers um, in Dubai's market that are just kind of holding on uh, to their asking price you know give or take a little bit of negotiation um, you know again I'm not an expert I'd like to ask you do you do you think we are gonna encounter that sharp drop in values in real estate uh, prices in the same way that we've encountered in the 2008 2009 or where it pretty much was across the board all areas in dubai there was no differentiation um off plan ready do you think we are going to encounter something similar during this crisis or that's a complete different uh, variations and variables to be considered in today's market I think the, uh, the important word that you mentioned there was differentiation between sectors and, and asset classes. I think if we look at the investment market, and I, I hold my hand up and say that I don't um, actively work in the investment market in the residential side, more in the commercial and uh, um, institutional side. So I, I won't talk about the residential for the moment. But what I would say from the commercial and institutional investment is it's actually very difficult. And this is going to sound you know, blasé and people might raise their eyes. It's very difficult to spend a billion dollars in the UA at the moment to get an institutional grade asset on institutional returns. And what I mean by that is, you know, the quality of the buildings are second to none, as, as Andrew mentioned, as he mentioned, and, and, and as you've mentioned within the region. But what we don't have is long term income to grade A covenant. You know, we don't have 10 years income to, and I pick a name out of the sky, Morgan Stanley, or, you know, 15 years income to HSBC that we would have in many other markets. So there's such a demand for long-term income, secure long-term income, that I don't think the investment value of those will, will decline. The competition will keep the yield process where it is. For um, assets where there's you know, an awful lot of similar or covenant strengths are, not, are you know, perhaps slightly less, maybe there'll be price movement. Again, I think there will be appetite from investors um, to invest in real estate. But the other thing that I think we have to mention, because it also has an impact on, on everything we talk about, the COVID is important and obviously affecting globally. But we have to also look at the, uh, the impact of oil pricing on real estate markets. And, and when we look at large development projects, we look at you know, master plan communities, et cetera, that are under construction, the value and volumes of these are significant. And when government investment is required, even in infrastructure or others, with oil price being suppressed, budgets are changing. And so the dynamics around each of those will change. So I think there will be adjustments in, uh, in the market. I, I'd be wrong of me to predict a percentage or to say which will go up, which will go down. But again, I think you know, the underlying fundamentals of any real estate project remain. You know, the location of the asset, the quality of the income flow and the quality of the tenant will certainly uh, ensure that assets are positioned in a, you know, in a positive way. And, and one thing I would just say on that is that with hotels and hospitality, which is an asset class that obviously is having some challenges because it's based on the operational income, the advice that we're giving to, um, to owners and, and, and actually owners are seeking this advice as well as us being proactive with it, is actually to use this time to reposition the assets, to carry out some of the refurbishment works that perhaps had been on hold or were due to happen to do those in a period of uncertainty. And that's an important word from a, from a real estate and an, and an RICS point of view. Um, but during this period of uncertainty, to use this time to, you know, to upgrade facilities so that when the lights come back on again, you know, the, the growth back to the stabilized occupancies or the stabilized ADRs will hopefully be a shorter curve than, uh, than to leave the assets as they were. So I think there are positives. Um, there will be negatives. We have to be grown up and say, you know, not everything is gonna be smiley and rosy. But I think seeking the right advice and looking at the right structures still give investors the opportunity to, uh, to make some capital gains for sure. 
totally agree. I mean, just from a uh, individual point of view, we've all been asked to kind of clean up house. So I think even from a business point of view, this is the time to do pretty much everything that you've had it on the to-do list. But when you're busy, you just don't have time to get to it. Um, so I think that was a very go good uh, tip on your part, uh, Simon. And, and let me ask you a question that I myself have been getting a lot these days um, in terms of how have you been able to carry out valuations? Again, recognizing the um, uh, difficulties and having to maybe uh, visit properties or to, to move around. Um, have you adapted to a new uh, technological method? Um, method can you tell us a little bit more on that yeah i think um i agree it's been you know it's got a little easier over the last couple of weeks with or certainly the last two weeks with the ability to move around a little bit freer but if you look um globally uh you know cbra has offices in every country and, and i spoke to singapore this morning and they've got another two weeks of they don't call it lockdown they call it circuit breaker um so they've got another two weeks of, of circuit breaker but they're still carrying out a large volume of valuations as we are and i think the, the, the changes that I've noticed, obviously the first change is that valuations are driven by data. So a lot of the, the data that the teams have, um, they've used this time to upgrade their databases, to clean up their data, to make sure their data is transparent. The methodology hasn't changed, the systems and procedures hasn't changed. What has changed is the ability to do the inspections. And I think pretty much every asset class um, has, if it's an existing asset, has somebody either on site um, whether it be a caretaker, an employee, a watchman, whatever it might be. We've actually done, and with the client's consent, and that's, that's an important point, you know, we have to agree the parameters and the mandate with the client. But with the client's consent, we've actually undertaken Zoom inspections where we've uh, almost used the watchman, and again, I, I mean this non-disrespectfully, we use the watchman a little bit as a drone, and he's walked us around the uh, the building, shown us all of the assets, uh, you know, and done everything we need to do. So, you know, inspections are poss possible, um, but you have to caveat the reports and the assumptions that you make on the same basis, because otherwise it's, uh, you know, you, you're in breach of all the regulations and best practices. I like that. I like, you know, again, humans will always find ways to adapt to the situation and do the best out, be it in education, be it an, in training, um, and of course in value. And my last question uh, uh, to you today, uh, uh, Simon, do, do you see a, a shift towards valuation uh, by machine learning versus traditional uh, valuation methods? And, and how do you feel about that personally? Yeah, I'm, I'm not the biggest supporter of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, I say I did my first valuation in 1991. And I, and I made a comment um, on our call yesterday. I, we talked about education in the valuation world. And the first text that we're asked to acquire as a student at any of the universities in the UK is a text that uh, Professor Andrew wrote. And I think I had maybe version three, you're probably up to version eight, version nine now. But in terms of how to deal with an income valuation, it's still our go-to text. And we all still have a copy of that sitting on the, uh, on the shelf. And that's an, the reason I raise that point in relation to this question is that the education that we have and the fundamentals of valuation that go back to you know when i was at university in, in the early 90s all the way through to to where we are today they haven't changed the human element of you know adjusting valuations the expertise of what assumptions to use and how to make those assumptions haven't changed i go back to my comments about residential valuation and how a residential investment it's not a sector i work in I think machine learning and, and AI will probably have a big impact on the residential mortgage valuations. And I look at our global businesses and, and I take Spain and Australia as two offices. A significant amount of our revenue is done without human involvement in the residential world. But the reason why that is, is because there's a significant amount of clean, transparent um, data, both privileged and also in the public domain. And so for us in the region here, and as you probably know, um, earlier, earlier in 2019, CBRE signed a relationship agreement with the lands department to work with them to clean up the data that exists, yeah. to get us a global, or to give us the ability to create a global platform of transparent data. When that exists, my worry about machine learning and artificial intelligence taking the role of a valuer, my worry grows a little bit, but I do think for specialist valuations, particularly hotels, um, large office buildings and and very much development projects where you know the human opinion is required. I think they're safe for a little while longer, but most of the clients are and you mentioned and and, and Professor Andrew mentioned and and Hind mentioned 
you know, in terms of the type of people that come on courses. They're not just um, graduates that want to become a valuer. They're experienced, seasoned real estate professionals that want to understand, you know, what does this mean? How do I use this? And so the role of the value is not just, here's a number, the value of your building is 10. You know, the role of the value is to explain, this is how 10 is made out. This is what the risks are around that. If you do this, it becomes 12. If you don't make these decisions, it becomes nine, whatever that might be. And that human side, I don't think can be replaced by machine learning or AI. Um, I've had 30 good years almost of uh, valuations and I hope there's another sort of, at least another 20 left before uh, machines and laptops do the work instead of us. Well, I sh surely hope so as well. I mean, like you uh, rightfully uh, pointed out, it seems that uh, Hind, yourself, and Professor Andrew are all pretty much on the same page, and I tend to agree with you. Um, there is there is no replacing to uh, the human element, the human touch, um, uh, the face-to-face -face interaction, the ability to sit down and to actually end up. Uh, 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 getting an idea of how this person feels um, in order to service them better, I guess. So, uh, but at the same time, you know, I think considering that what we have faced in uh, the past couple of uh, months have shown that we are resilient in the way that we can always adapt to change. And um, again, I want to thank you for your time with us this morning. With this, I want to move over to uh, Nahla. Good morning again, Nahla, hope you're well. <laughs> Good morning, Hiba. Lucky you guys. I'm freezing here. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty cold, right? It's pretty cold and raining outside. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm hopefully you'll come and visit us in uh, uh, sunny uh, Dubai soon, very soon. I'm in July, when it's 50 degrees. Hopefully. I think you'll enjoy it at that point. Um, now, now, what I want to hear from you this morning is about the tools um, that are required to embrace digital transformation in real estate education and in all areas, um, uh, to be honest, uh, within the uh, real estate uh, industry. So can you take us through the journey uh, from traditional business to digital business, based on your research paper that you have done on real estate disruption, how is digital transformation reshaping business, particularly in real estate? Um, great uh, question, great start, Hiba, thank you. So basically, um, I'll quickly touch upon the research that I've conducted back in 2014, 2015, with focus on the major elements that contributed to disrupting real estate in industry. I mean, it's not a buzzword, it's reality. So what cont contributed to that, the fast growth of an advancement in technology faced with a gap in human adoption of that technology and the changes to how companies, they were kind of balancing the operating in, in, in order to transform from traditional business to digital business. I've been in business for some time working on all kinds of business models. So the traditional business model to me, it appears to be like kind of requires uh, to be enhanced because it's costly, it takes time, the implementation, the static, and so on and so forth, versus the digital model that has advantage over the traditional. And this is across all industries, including uh, real estate. So my recommendation was in that report, hey guys, rethink the investment. I'm not saying that you eliminate what you've invested, but instead of like freezing it up or replace it with something in you, with a new investment model, um, uh, invest in digital, which has the ability to, to change in short time and implement uh, quickly. So basically for, for us in this, who um, adapted uh, or adopted the, the digital transformation, I take it as you said, it's a journey and it's not a destination. So where this take us today now we we started from digital from traditional uh, business model to digital business model today at Idri, we're thinking on working on a new report new uh, research report transformation from digital uh, using the casual model of uh, sorry from from digital business model into future 
business model. The future business model kind of science fiction, it's not science fiction, it is there. Like we use kind of in business the forecasting and one of the elements in forecasting, we use the casual models. Uh, the casual model is the most sophisticated kind of forecasting tool where we map the cone on uncertainty. Imagine you walk into a world full of uncertainty and this uncertainty uh, presents itself as an opportunity. Of course, there is logic. This is science, it's not uh, prediction. So the future of, of business, the technology would be adopted in, it, it is there, it is in the making, it is here in Europe, it is in the United States, it's in the lab, it's being worked on. So uh, this technology have the potential to change every aspect of our, uh, our world as we know it. As I said, it's kind of science fiction. And while I'm speaking, I'm visualizing it. You know, uh, we as marketers always visualize things. So the future business model will be fully automated processes. This is how all the research, um, all the lab that I visited, all the digital, uh, the technology company that I've been collaborated with on various projects, this is the future. Kind of, if I put it this, and I hope, uh, I know I will come to the education, the traditional, because it's still um, I'm in favor of a human element, the mass house. Imagine that the company kind of the mass mathematical house, whereby algorithm is creating value for the business. So this is in a nutshell, the transformation. As a journey, as you said. As a journey, absolutely. Now we can move um, on to the, how do we achieve, obviously this is diagnosis, all right? So how do we achieve this digital uh, velocity? So to achieve, we have um, a number of tools. We have a number of elements that we need to work on. It's, it's like, you know, um, a 360 degrees where each and every organization has to master the digital talent pr uh, practices by employing um, artificial intelligence. I know Simon was not in favor of <laughs> artificial intelligence. However, well, it's not an option. Uh, what Simon is saying, you know, like you said, he was in a favor, maybe not necessarily for commercial, but yet for residential. So we might see uh, this kind of digital transformation happening in certain aspects within the business model, but not across the board on, on every level, right? Uh, I hope so. As I said, I'm still in favor of, of a human element. And then the other um, element that the company need, particularly in real estate, because real estate is a human driven, it's a service. And anything is service is a human involving people, right? So the digital operation uh, where we focus on the customer uh, model, and it's it's easily said to say that we need to, to be customer driven organization. Many people claim to have that. But the literature, um, I mean, the project that um, we worked on, I've been involved in, where we worked on the, the um, rational expectation versus emotional expectation. And here where we are come in agreement with our panelists about the human element. And the machine cannot and unable to deal with the emotional uh, element of, of a human being. Now, uh, that is a little bit complicated. I will not dive it. I'll leave it to audience if they have any question on the customer centric because it, it has a number of processes. It's very, very detailed. And the other element obviously is the digital technology, which is happening now because traditional technology does not help us anymore. So in a conclusion, as we said, Hiba, it's kind, it's not a destination where we move from one model to other. To us, in, in this business, we take it as a journey. As, and as we uh, keep moving, we keep enhancing, revising, implementing, testing. So testing is very much part of this uh, business. So let me ask you about uh, marketing, right? So uh, I know you're also a marketing expert. Uh, what type of maybe suggestions or tips can you offer our audience today 
um, and of course, whoever gets to actually uh, listen to the session at a later time, uh, what <coughs> tools can they utilize in order to, like for example, I can tell you everybody is moving to the uh, uh, virtual uh, listing programs where they can take you on a virtual tool. What other tools can you suggest for brokers and, and different stakeholders in the market? See, Hiba, before we talk about the tools, I think let's look at it from the macro perspective. Uh, because tools keep changing, right? Um, there is fundamental element here. Who should drive, and let's all of us here think about this question, who should lead the digital transformation in the organization? Is it IT department? Definitely not. I mean, why I say it's, it's marketing who should lead the digital transformation because marketing deals with, with the human um, behavior, all right, all the time. So first we need to have this because it does not exist in the organization when you talk about digital transformation, first thing comes to mind is um, IT. When we talk data science and marketing, people like, you know, raised eyebrows, what marketing has to do with, with data science. So it's very much embedded in, in the marketing uh, discipline. Think about it like, you know, the customer journey in the organization. Who is in charge? Which department? So I would like to talk from the macro level first because there is a need for a mind change. Um, so it's, it's, it's the marketer. Adding to that, that marketers are no stranger to digital uh, disruption. The advances that's been happening uh, for decades in digital technology has transformed the world of marketing perhaps more than any other discipline. And most marketers that um, um, associated with, we see this brave, we call it, I call it, this is my own terminology, brave new world of digital as a game changer. So uh, um, to conclude on this particular, I would say that the digital age has opened up countless doors and new opportunities when it comes to understanding our customer and developing creating marketing message to engage with them. So brands, companies, everyone has to capitalize on marketing. And um, I can go into tools, there are plenty of tools, but this is not, um, there is no one rule fits it all. Okay, we need to adapt and we need to see where it fits. Um, and this is the role of marketing. And I agree with you because that simply takes us through uh, to the, my next question today is, um, education, right? So there are tools, if you're not aware of it, you know what, this is the time for you to uh, educate yourself. And what I want from you is to uh, highlight for me or tell me, um, for example, how do you bring potentially uh, digital transformation into uh, education? And again, education could be for real estate or pretty much any factor. Uh, well, um, you know, Hiba, in real estate, we always have that adage, location, location, location. I'm not promoting this adage because for me, still living outside the city is much healthier, like, you know, where you breathe fresh air. Here, I would replace it by education, education, education. I hardly emphasize on that, building on my professional career where education has been the essential element in my success. If I'm a success, successful uh, career person, so education. Now, the education uh, sector, which um, contains like teaching professors, where we have professors, uh, and I was enjoying my professor Andrew talking, like I imagine myself in the classroom, you know, engaging oh, with them. That is, that is is in the classroom in, in October during <laughs> that is a stimulation Heba, here. There is intellectual stimulation that machine cannot replace it. And then, yes, you can use the tool. There are various tools that um, we can implement in, in uh, in the education and the education sector is not immune to being uberized like you know uber system is across um, the sectors so usually if um, 
uh, and I think the, the education institution realized that. So if, uh, if we're looking in the education system, being Dubai Real Estate Institute or any program that we introduce for agility, efficiency, I think I would look, I would adopt the cloud. There are many other initiatives, but for this particular purpose and to answer your question, I would um, go for, for cloud. The cloud is, is a must. Um, we need to be careful here when we're talking about digital education or digital um, or in online. Uh, keep in mind that MOOC being there for decades, yet it's only now being um, promoted or heard of much than the past because we need to, to strike the right balance in the digital transformation. To remain competitive post-COVID, we still, we will go back to classroom, all right? So we need not to eliminate the human contact. That's true. And Nahla, just one last thing, because I know we're um, almost running out of time, but I do want to uh, get a, a quick answer on this question um, in terms of your experience in crisis management. Can you share with us which <coughs> crisis management model is suitable for this crisis we are witnessing today? So today, Hiba, we are in, in out of the five components of problem, we are in a chaotic and disorder stage. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, so. how, however, I would ask the audience and everyone need to ask their colleagues, all right? Um, crises have happened before, right? Yes, it happened. If history is our guide, they will happen again. So there is a good book that I would recommend for our audience to read, The History of Real Estate, which is the Cambridge publication. Uh, in this particular uh, situation, what we recommend is uh, values driven crisis leadership and not management. Now we, we reword it from management into leadership. Leadership need to focus on, on, let's say, empathetic emotional intelligence, need to focus on the dimension of employee well being, like physical, emotional, financial. I'm sure we all in social as well. Particular model to close it up, I would recommend. Um, and that we use it, I've been handling crisis like from 9-11 to real estate in 2008 and so on. The diffusion of innovation theory. And the name suggests by, or it's self-explanatory that each employee come out with something innovative to overcome uh, tough times. And don't underestimate anyone in the organization, including the stakeholder, uh, one solution to the department, the marketing and communication we were facing, the solution came from Office Poi, and we implemented, and um, it's been um, communicated to everyone. Last but not least, we need to be responsive, and we need to have continuous uh, learning mi mindset, and guys, don't go for short term. This is a killer for the organization. Medium term and then long term. Thank you. And don't, adopt, uh, don't abandon technology. <laughs> don't abandon <laughs> technology, think long term. Uh, yes, uh, technology will be great for some sectors, not for others. Uh, do not eliminate the human touch. This is pretty much really, I would want to say, uh, the most that I've, uh, the key points that I have uh, uh, taken out from today's session. Before we wrap it up, I'm just trying to see if we have uh, some questions because we are definitely running out of time. Um, okay, hi Hiba, I'm one of your students. Would like to check with you regarding the broker ID as mine is expired in April because of the situation, there is no class open. If it's reopened, uh, will I be able to do the renewal? Well, to answer your question, um, that would be a question for me, I guess. Uh, you can take the online course. Uh, you do not need to wait until we open up again. Uh, this is a course you take online. You get a certificate of uh, uh, attendance. You can use that certificate to renew your, um, your, your uh, certification. Uh, and then what we can do is we will talk about the exam and we'll open it up to you once we uh, go back, hopefully in July. So there are no worries at all you can take the online course. Um, 
great to have a person like Professor Andrew. Thank you so much, Professor Andrew, for being uh, on this webinar uh, with us. And wonderful to hear from Ms. Hind and learn about everything that DREI is doing uh, for the students. Thank you, Jeevan. Um, and I think Jeevan also is thanking me. Thank you so much, Jeevan, for conducting an excellent webinar. I'm so glad that you uh, found it helpful, insightful. Um, and with that said, I want to thank you, our panelists, again. Hope you all have a wonderful day ahead. And uh, please, for our participants, um, would love to hear from you. So if there are anything else that we can um, address in uh, other DREI talks, we're here to listen. We're here to provide you with what you need. Um, and thank you. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Thank, you. thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye.